So the next speaker is uh, Mike Carducci. He's a professor of oncology at the Johns Hopkins uh, University, and he is the leader of the prostate uh, cancer program in the phase one uh, trial unit. So he will um, give a talk on the repurposing drugs for cancer therapy. Dr. Rahul and uh, Dr. Labots and the rest of the organizing committee for having me here. Um, so I'm going to be talking about repurpose, repurposing drugs uh, for cancer therapy. Uh, we have three examples that we've brought to the clinic over the last three years, uh, and there's a lot of lessons to learn from this because, again, there was initial excitement about how this could speed up drug development. So related to these, this talk, I have no disclosures, uh, but I am going to be talking about potential uh, uses of three drugs that are off-label. That would be itraconazole, disulfiram, and digoxin. So the idea really is can we accelerate drug development by using drugs that are already on the market and finding out if they have cancer indications and then test them in clinical trials. So our labs have shown that itraconazole in the lab is an anti-angiogenic as well as a hedgehog inhibitor. And so how would we test that as we moved it forward? Disulfram is shown to be a weak uh, DNA methyltransferase inhibitor as well as a copper chelator. So again, a drug that's very messy, has a number of effects approved for alcohol abuse. Digoxin, a cardiac glycoside uh, shown by the Semenza lab at our place uh, that it's a HIF-1 alpha inhibitor. So in a class of drugs that we've all been looking for, uh, and does it really affect a HIF-1 uh, expression? And so now that we've done a couple studies, what have we learned is sort of my goals of this talk. So it's all started with uh, us developing a library, as many other centers have, and pharmaceutical companies having a lot of drugs uh, on their shelves that sort of have various level of activity. So the drugs are already there. And can we use them and use some of our new high throughput screening to see whether or not we can have effects? And the idea was that the most fruitful drug discovery may be from drugs that we already have. So June Liu at our place had proposed this sort of thing. If you look sort of along the timeline, uh, sort of normal drug development, starting with target development, optimizing the lead, selecting a candidate, moving it through phase one to two to three to register it to market, it takes on average around 15 years and almost a billion dollars. So the idea is if you take one of these drugs that you sort of can bypass all the early selection and go right to phase two, skipping a major step of drug development with uh, drugs that that's already been done for, for their indications uh, already. Uh, so at our place, we have a library of about 4,000 drugs. It keeps expanding. It exists in 96 well plates. So you go over to the library and say, I have a screen for antiangiogenesis. I have a screen for hedgehog inhibitors. Uh, they're able to sort of test that and then sort of give you a priority list of uh, uh, agents that are on theirs that sort of have effects in your screening assay. So the first one to come out of that was itraconazole. So itraconazole is an oral antifungal agent. It's used for the systemic treatment of mycosis, uh, cryptococcal meningitis. Uh, the FDA dose is, uh, starts out at a 600 milligram dose and then brought down to 200 as the daily dose. Uh, and again, in doing prostate cancer, we were sort of interested because it has the same last name as ketoconazole, uh, but this doesn't affect adrenal androgen synthesis, so we thought it would be a new and unique pathway to move forward. So once they had it through the initial panel as an anti-angiogenic, uh, we did a number of laboratory studies of proving that it was an angiogenesis inhibitor, as well as uh, blocking hedgehog uh, pathway inhibition. And I'll show you a series of that data that allowed us to move forward. So here's just a screen looking at HUVEX uh, and their ability to proliferate. So itraconazole comes to the top with the lowest uh, concentration to affect this assay. Uh, and again, the earliest preliminary screen for itraconazole. If you look at VEGF and uh, FGF uh, in terms of a uh, cell culture, you can see that with increasing concentrations of itraconazole that you block pr uh, proliferation of this uh, group of cell lines. This is primarily lung cancer uh, in this model here. You're looking at uh, a mouse matrix gel model, sort of various uh, effects on the itraconazole. You see the difference in the tumor type varying very bloody in the vehicle, the number of vessels, sort of a reduction of the vessels uh, by staining in the lower uh, cartoon, uh, lower f uh, immunohistochemical study, less vessels, and you sort of see just sort of by measuring uh, blood vessel density, it's lower for the itraconazole arm. 
and then looking at a prostate cancer model, you sort of see the, the, the mice and the size of their tumors, the delay in progression, uh, suggesting, again, an anti-tumor effect in this model. With Hedgehog, this was a group out of the Beachy lab at our place. He's mo subsequently moved to Stanford. But again, with patch uh, signaling smoothen and then smoothen activating glee, uh, we found that the uh, intraconazole blocks sig similar to cyclopamine, and then you sort of get uh, no downstream effects. So when our assays, we've been looking at glee uh, uh, expression as a marker of uh, inhibition of the Hedgehog pathway. So here's sort of a cell line that sort of is triggered and uh, stimulated with sonic hedgehog, uh, and they have a glee luciferase reporter. So again, if you inhibit it, the glee actually the expression will, will drop. So you see all of the azoles uh, on the bottom list with the black line being the closest to me, uh, showing the greatest inhibition of glee expression uh, using luciferase as the reporter. Uh, so in that was the first uh, inkling that this was a, a hedgehog inhibitor pathway. Going to medulloblastoma, where it's dependent on hedgehog signaling, you see a, a mouse model with the medulloblastoma and sort of various agents that inhibit hedgehogs. So you've got itraconazole as a lower dose red and then the blue, so a, a minor dose effect. Cyclopamine, the classic one being evaluated uh, as sort of the first hedgehog inhibitor and then the combination. So you see uh, an effect on it with itraconazole. And then finally, looking at glee staining, comparing the itraconazole at 100 milligrams per kilogram versus the cyclopamine compared to the control, you see glee expression by this uh, average plot has decreased, again, suggesting it's a hedgehog inhibitor. So we move forward in prostate cancer. Some data about hedgehog inhibition might be appropriate in prostate cancer as an anti-angiogenic. Uh, so we went to a setting of castration-resistant prostate cancer and looking at sort of an endpoint of progression, but also built in a lot of uh, secondary endpoints to sort of look, are we truly blocking hedgehog, if possible, and looking at angiogenesis. So this was done through the D Department of Defense Prostate Cancer Clinical Trials Con Consortium. We were expecting to randomize 29 patients to each arm, but we did have an early stopping rule for futility, and we were given patients either the standard or low dose of 200 milligrams a day or 300 milligrams twice a day, 600 milligrams of the itraconazole daily. Uh, so we were looking for the number of men who did not progress at 24 weeks. Uh, we had estimated that that would be 20%, uh, that if we could sort of increase that to 45%, we would say that would be clinically significant and of meaning. Uh, and so the studies and the statistics was powered based on sort of that improvement in uh, the delay of PSA progression. We also looked at a number of pharmacokinetics, circulating tumor cells, looking if it, again, in prostate cancer, uh, is it affecting the uh, uh, androgen receptor signaling pathways that may have its effect, as well as uh, did we have any upstream effects of on ACTH, cortisol, or aldosterone. Look at plasma VEGF levels, and then uh, glee expression in skin biopsies as a surrogate. So this was the primary data. So this is PSA progression-free survival for the high dose versus the low dose. The low dose stopped early for futility, not going to meet uh, its primary endpoint. But here for the high dose, uh, the number of patients that had not progressed was 48%. The threshold was 45%. Uh, so we felt that it was a positive study. Looking at sort of median PSA progression-free survival, it was about five weeks uh, uh, longer for the patients on the high dose. If you look at just uh, straightforward progression-free survival, and these patients were imaged every two months. Uh, so again, at 24 weeks, they had had two scans and had uh, so a stable scan and then a second stable scan. So 62% of the patient had not had progression uh, at that 24-week uh, pain point on the uh, high-dose arm or the 600 milligrams per day compared to 12 weeks progression-free survival median versus 36. And this was similar data to a study we had already previously reported of a, another anti-angiogenic tesquinamod, which went to phase three uh, testing, and that study is maturing. So if you put that data, it's very similar in terms of uh, progression-free survival. 
If you look at just PSA responses, so you see here, this is any decline, 30% decline, 50% decline. 50% decline is sort of what we've used in the literature to sort of compare with other drugs. Uh, some of the surrogacy data is in the larger dose of taxol studies would say you want to drop by 30%. So in a waterfall plot, you see clearly more patients on the high dose had declines in their PSA, 30% having at least a 30% decline, and 15% having a 50% decline. If you look at the circulating tumor cells, you're sort of going to the bottom line with the arrow. So those that are sort of prognostically indicated, those who have a, a pretreatment circulating tumor cells of greater than or equal to five cells. Uh, so that was eight patients of those eight. Uh, five of them had their number drop below the five threshold on subsequent testing. Uh, so about a 62% uh, rate for that uh, marker. Looking at the pharmacokinetics, you sort of see itraconazole uh, over here, sort of the concentrations, those that don't progress, that those do progress, so it was correlated that at a higher dose you had less progression. And then if you look here, as you increase the concentration, the percentage of patients that had a, a change was uh, greater uh, at the higher concentrations, and it sort of correlated as well with time to PSA progression. Looking at androgen synthesis, so basically these curves are slightly going up. So we didn't see any decline in uh, testosterone, DHEA, in this uh, study with the high dose. Again, suggesting that this is not another uh, ketoconazole. If you look at uh, GLE response, uh, waterfall response, looking at the skin, so again, for down-modulated in the high dose, 68% of the patients had the GLE expression down-modulated in their skin biopsies. And if you correlated that with outcome in terms of their PSA progression-free survival, oh, sorry. Uh, you see here the GLE downregulation patients are, are on this curve. Uh, those that did not have any downregulation uh, had a, a lower, uh, shorter uh, outcome. And it holds up too when you look at the disease progression free survival. Similar data for that itraconazole. Toxicity was similar, uh, a little bit similar to what we see with ketoconazole or abiraterone is hypertension, edema, and hypokalemia. Uh, so there clearly is effect potentially on the ACTH and aldosterone pathways. All these patients were excluded from getting steroids, so there would have been a compounded effect with that. Uh, so those are just caveats as sort of we move forward with using this agent uh, in subsequent studies. So we concluded that the 600 mill, uh, milligram per day met its primary endpoint. The lower dose was closed because of futility, uh, that it met all of our endpoints of producing a pro PSA progression-free survival and a progression-free survival that was uh, exceeding our historical control, and that all of the endpoints in terms of looking at the glee modulation and the PKs all correlated with clinical outcomes that we didn't see any uh, androgen suppression and that the side effects there were manageable uh, and patients did not stop the study because of these side effects, which was also encouraging. So when we tried to sort of move this forward, uh, again, this is itraconazole, it's all, you know, the company sort of has moved on, isn't really interested in sort of moving forward. Was this enough data for the Janssen to sort of want to move forward? Well, they already have abiraterone, so there was an interest. Uh, could the cooperative groups in the U.S. do this? Who is going to pay for the drug? So really, we weren't able to move it forward to phase three, so we accelerated. We got to phase two, we got a positive study, but then we really couldn't go anywhere. But, you know, different companies have picked it up, and what has happened, Maine, uh, M-A-Y-N-E Pharma, has looked at it and says, you know, we could make this a new drug if we just sort of change the isomer. So now it's a new drug, but now they have to go back and do a lot of the early phase studies, slowing down drug development. And then Hedgepath, who really wants to sort of take drugs like this that are hedgehog inhibitors and move them forward. So we have uh, allowed these companies to get together and they formed uh, a partnership and they're looking forward to moving this forward uh, as a hedgehog inhibitor. Uh, and studies are being done in lung cancer and prostate cancer. Our group at Hopkins also did itraconazole with pemetrexid and saw sort of a higher response when combined with pemetrexid in lung cancer. So they are also moving forward uh, with itraconazole. So moving to disulfiram, 
So again, a messy drug. Everyone told me, wow, you're going to move that forward. Patients aren't going to want to stop drinking. Uh, and that was our biggest eligibility criteria in terms of could you stop drinking. But the data in the laboratory had suggested that, you know, all of the work that we've done at Hopkins and Epigenetics looking for easier, tolerable drugs compared to the ones that are on the market, such as azacitidine and decitabine, we thought, well, if we this was true, this would be a great way to sort of give a chronically dosed oral agent. And much of the data really suggested that it was a DNA methyltransferase inhibitor. It came through the screen and the biology really sort of fit that it would sort of react at the thiol group attacking the C6 position of cytosine affecting uh, methyl uh, transferase inhibition. So it fit from a biologic perspective. We weren't the only group that was showing this, so there was a lot of consistency of the data. And we published this uh, in 2011, our list of data showing upregulation of, of gene expression in our prostate cancer cell lines as a weather of growth inhibitory effects. So we saw that it was an inhibitor with tumor suppression restoration. So the classic give the thing, can you restore genes, that it had a very low concentration, which could be achievable when we gave it to human patients. So we felt that we could get that micromolar concentration. We knew that we may not see uh, effects on PSA, uh, so it didn't make PSA go up. Um, and uh, only at high doses did we see declines in PSA. It slowed tumor growth. And what we were really looking at was we weren't doing a study to determine whether or not it had uh, clinical benefit, although that was going to be sort of a secondary endpoint, because if you put in a patient with prostate cancer and their PSA drops, we would get excited. But we gave it to patients really looking to sort of look at their peripheral blood and looking at their 5-methyl-C, their global methyl concentration in their peripheral blood. And we know that that's a relatively stable thing over time, and could we reduce that by 10% by using the agent, suggesting that it was a DNA methyltransferase. So again, we did this through the Prostate Cancer Clinical Trials Consortium. We were really looking, the primary assay was to see whether this was a DNA, methyl, uh, DNA methylating, demethylating agent. And so our endpoint was the proportion who had achieved a demethylating response. And our change was a 10% in global methyl C uh, DNA methylation in the peripheral blood mononucleosides. So we started at the uh, FDA approved dose. Again, this is a drug where you give a higher concentration for the first month and then you lower the dose. Uh, but we knew that you could give a month of the high dose, so we were going to test that. But we wanted to start with the low dose. And if we saw that there was not much DNA methylation, we were going to dose escalate. If we saw that more than three patients had DNA methylation, then we were going to expand that cohort to sort of see what the percentage was, then escalate to see if it was greater in, in the subsequent cohort. So you see here, this is uh, hard data to really look at. So we're looking at uh, cycle one, cycle two, cycle three, thinking we didn't know how long it took to sort of see these changes. So we were checking every month to look at this change in global uh, demethylation. We had two samples prior to them starting to sort of get their average state of methyl content, and then we looked at a 10% decline. And you see sort of at the low dose, the first arm, none of the patients sort of had demethylation at their first cycle. Uh, so patients started to drop off. Uh, we got to nine to eight. One patient had a DNA methylation change and uh, persisted uh, in, or another patient had it here. I'll show you that data. So we had two patients in that group, less than our three, so we did expand that cohort. Uh, we didn't expand that cohort because we weren't going to get to where we wanted to be. We went to the high dose, and we see that there were two patients here uh, that had DNA methylation after one cycle, so earlier, uh, two persist, and at the end, we did have three patients who had a DNA methylation change uh, in that study, so theoretically uh, positive. So you sort of see when these patients had their DNA methylation response. So at cycle two, uh, at the higher dose, there were these two patients, one at the lower dose. Uh, you see here at cycle three, uh, but nobody really persists with it or at the end of study. So in many cases, we found that it was one time only, not other times, short-lived, not persistent. So really no consistency using the assay that we looked at. And then we found that what everybody told me was that it's a toxic drug. Uh, so again, men were able to stay off alcohol, but uh, again, at the higher dose, uh, 
over half the patients stopped the drug because of side effects, uh, ataxia, wobbliness, constipation, uh, feeling just lousy. Another 30% declined to persist on the study even though they didn't meet uh, toxicity or toxicity stopping rules. Uh, so you sort of see that, uh, again, at the high dose, even though it may affect DNA methylation at a small fraction of patients, uh, it was none safe uh, for that group of patients. Uh, we looked at PK data, and at the higher dose, it did correlate with uh, being on and having uh, met the methylation. So this is the important data that if there is anything about disulfiram in other tumor types or patient tolerability, uh, that the higher the concentration may have an effect on meeting this endpoint. Looking at the clinical endpoint, nobody had a PSA decline. Nobody stayed on more than six months. So compared to the itraconazole, there was no clinical signal in this patient population using PSA, no change in kinetics. So here we had a toxic drug, PSA didn't benefit, may have met the endpoint, uh, but sort of very soft in terms of it, does it really meet the muster? It's not ever going to compare against decidabine or azacitidine. So in this case, we went through the whole process and felt that this really isn't a drug that we would uh, move forward in prostate cancer. Once this paper came out, I've gotten emails from a lot of people who still believe. Um, so, you know, that's why we've got to make sure even though it's a negative study, people know about it or learn from this as we go forward. It could have been how we measured DNA methylation, but we did not see clinical benefit at all in the uh, 16 patients that we treated. So moving to digoxin, this is uh, the least mature, although this paper came out in 2009. Uh, this is from the Semenza group looking at digoxin and other cardiac glycosides blocking HIF-1 uh, synthesis and tumor growth. Uh, so using the same drug library, he went to Dr. Luz with his uh, panel for looking at HIF-1 inhibition. And what came through out of the 11 drugs, many of these were cardiac glycosides. So very much uh, consistent uh, in the data. Greg Semenza called me and said, you know, Mike, I've seen you do this. Why can't we just move it forward and really wanted to do it tomorrow? But you can see my approach is really, is it true what they're saying it does is the real key. Although we could do a study of digoxin, but we wouldn't really know if the effect was related to how they've hypothesized. So here's the data in a P493 MIC model. So again, you see uh, suppression of growth in the first blot. Digoxin reduces HIF-1 alpha expression. And you sort of see some of the downstream effects of HIF-1 uh, uh, expression and then decrease of GLU-1, VEGF, HK1, and HK2, again, all in this PNAS paper in 2008. Working with uh, Hank and the folks at, at Utrecht, we'd already done some early studies, actually work that Bob uh, started with us when we were doing a joint fellowship with Agon. We were looking at sort of HIF expression in breast tumor, and so we already knew what tumor to go to because and at the IHC level, uh, HIF-1 expression is the highest in breast cancer. And so if we were going to sort of look at down regulation, that was the tissue. Of course, I want to do it in prostate cancer, but it's so uh, difficult to stain for HIF-1 in prostate cancer, so we really were not going to be able to detect it. So through a number of papers that have been published, uh, HIF-1 alpha in breast cancer really was the target that we were going for. And so Verit Stearns and her group at our breast cancer program has been doing a number of window of opportunity studies. So women get diagnosed with breast cancer are scheduled for their uh, uh, either lumpectomy or mastectomy and using uh, that time until that surgery to give them a drug agent and look at that tissue for drug effect. So we know that they express HIF-1-alpha. Can we give the drug for two weeks, look at that tissue for down expression to sort of say, yes, this is how it's working. There's also been concern that other folks have reported that digoxin is a weak estrogen, and so there would be concern to give it to patients, so uh, that was a part of it. So it is this window of opportunity study that we've been looking at where we've placed the digoxin study in our problem. But, you know, staining for HIF-1-alpha, what those three papers that sort of looked at the expression didn't do was how reliable is this, how validated is the assay, can you look at tissue? So we had to, before we did this study, we had to step back 
and take the core biopsy, then the tissue, and sort of look at hip expression and see how often they correlated, sort of look at the amount of expression so that if we wanted to see a decrease, where would we be starting from? And so those were all sorts of things that our group has done. Uh, this is done from Ed Gabrielson, one of our pathologists uh, working with our breast group, looking at the breast biopsy specimen and then the matched surgical specimen and looking at hip flint staining and scoring uh, and then looking at the correlation. You see that a uh, again, from intraspecimen, looking at the same tissue over and over, uh, there's excellent agreement. When you look from the biopsy to the match surgical session, it's reduced to sort of considered moderate agreement in terms of the staining. What they showed, so with that, they had enough data that it's reliable to move forward. So this study just launched about uh, three months ago. It's part of our SPORE project in breast cancer, as you could combine other drugs. But they're going to be looking at HIF-1 target genes in the breast cancer tissue, KI-67, and then looking for a two-week exposure to women with breast cancer. Uh, so their power was that they saw that the average expression level was using a unit of 2.43, and they suggested that they would be interested if there's a 33% reduction. Uh, so they're looking at a 25 per arm group to look at a, showing an 85% power to detect that 30 percent reduction. So this study is now going. It's through the Translational Research Breast Cancer Group Consortium throughout uh, the U.S., in prostate cancer, as I said, we wanted to go there because when we looked at the data, you know, we were talking about the data. We went to our group over the School of Public Health, and they said, well, you know, we have access to the um, uh, health providers study out of Boston, and we can sort of look at the number of men who are taking digoxin and look at their incidence of prostate cancer. And what you see here is just sort of that effect that the more digoxin or the longer you're on the digoxin, your incidence of prostate cancer was reduced. So... That was interesting, and Greg Cements is saying, well, look, you even have proven it more that you should be doing a study, but we have never done it, but one of the fellows who was working with me at the time that we did, he uh, moved to Thomas Jefferson. He launched a study, just a very simple study without a lot of correlates, uh, and that study has just uh, finished accrual, hasn't shown me the results, but looking at digoxin in the guys with a rising PSA after local therapy to seeing if there is uh, any effect on PSA progression. So again, we have been able to move that study forward. Unfortunately, I don't know the results for you today. So what have we learned? So we're able to move it, sort of bypass it. So it's pretty quickly, these lab studies didn't take that long to sort of provide the rationale, or that's when the scientists had come over to us clinical investigators to say, would you be interested? The FDA, we got exemptions from them. We weren't going to be changing the label, so they had no concern. We had to do a lot of fundraising uh, to uh, pay for itraconolol, $7 a day, uh, over a period of time uh, that was going to caused a lot. The clinical trial itself and infrastructure for that, so we used a lot of foundational support. So we were able to launch all three of these studies using that approach. None of these are sponsored by the companies who make the drugs. So when you go to the sponsors and say, look at this great indication for your drug, they're not interested. You know, they look at it and say, wow, what is it about the drug that we can make a new drug? And if we make a new drug, then we can make more money. So it is sort of, again, has it sped it up? And I think there is interested. I think the itraconazole model of it's just an isomer transformation uh, that allows it to maintain all those anti-tumor activities. So the cost of studies and the drugs for this is considerable. Where we got stuck is I did not have enough money or fundraising ability to pay for a phase three study. Uh, and did we have uh, all of it together to pay for that? So we really have worked with uh, venture capitals and other small companies who are willing to move forward with us uh, again. But we're in a lull. We're waiting again <laughs> to sort of see if we can move this forward. Um, Again, does it spark interest in creating better drugs? Uh, that would be sort of one of the other excitements. The issue for me is uh, patients already, you know, we have a propaganda engine at Hopkins to tell you how great the drug is. It's been published. There's press releases. And so patients say, well, why aren't you giving me a triconazole? So do I have enough data to stand on in front of them? And the answer is no, okay? Uh, but sort of in panels like, uh, that have just been described, 
could it sort of fit in there uh, based on some of the pathways? If you had a hedge pathway inhibition or mo mutation, why wouldn't you? Uh, there's a very expensive drug on the market, so this might be a cheaper way to do that. So those are the sorts of things that I think we've learned. Uh, there's more coming. Uh, the bendazoles uh, seem to be BRAF inhibitors in melanoma, so antiparasitic drugs are being evaluated as well. So it's exciting, but difficult. So thanks for your time and all the patients who helped us with these studies. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, any questions? I knew I was going to get one from you. <laughs> it's a, um, Mike, I, th uh, I think it's very important work. Maybe it's not so sexy, but uh, it's very important work. And um, the second drug, I would, uh, uh, you took the a society dean. But uh, it's, in fact, uh, the Oxy Society Dean was more successful in the clinic than the A Society Dean itself um, as a hypomethylating agent and in, in the hematologists uh, use that drug. And uh, perhaps your, um, your schedule is not ideal uh, and you would like to have an in, uh, oral drug and uh, as a, you know, the Deoxy Society Dean is now being prepared as an oral drug. By Celgene, right? And uh, so it may be more impo important to try it still. Um, and perhaps uh, in a high risk tumor like polyposis, where you are very strong in, in, uh, at Hopkins, or uh, recurrent bladder cancer, where you can measure the methyl groups in the urine very clearly. The methyl groups are present in the urine, of course, also of the prostate, but for the urine, it's a little more easier than for the prostate to measure the methyl groups. Right. And uh, then you can get quickly an, uh, an impression of it. So I think the oral availability of the drug, and I think it's cell gene that is working on it, uh, it's, it's very, and then you have it, uh, it will be paid. Yeah, so I mean, certainly disulfiram is oral, and what we found out is that uh, the active agent, when it's changed in cell lines, isn't produced. So again, Don Coffey at our place was concerned about whether the study would be positive. But the oral, you know, azacitidine, decitabine, you know, we're doing studies, our Stand Up to Cancer project uh, that uh, Steve Bale and Peter Jones are doing, that's one of the main studies that, that's being evaluated is the oral combinations uh, with the histone deacetylase and colon cancer as the primary endpoint. Of that we're looking at. Mike, can I just uh, pick up uh, on the disulfiram and just pose a question. Do you think you were too quick to jump away from it based on PSA responses? Because as we know, PSA responses are not what we always believe them to be, you know, in terms of real anti-tumor effect. And the way this may be working may be very different. It may be a stabilization effect, and it may work over a long period of time. So I just want to get your reaction to that. So I think that's the reaction I get when people tell me that I've given up too early uh, and that they want to continue to evaluate it. So I think from that perspective in other tumor types or in prostate cancer, you know, we're looking at a PSA endpoint and even though men can be fixated on it, you know, we've been able to let them sort of say, hey, it may rise, we didn't really see it decline, and if your scans aren't getting worse, we're going to stick with it. So we've really been able to sort of hone that down with our patients. Uh, the problem in this one was that I moved quickly was because it was really toxic. So the 500 dose, you know, is why they only give it for a month and then they drop it. You know, the, men, the desire of these men to not drink alcohol during the course of the study. So it was a lot of that combination stuff that sort of, to me, felt it very hard that I had to push the dose to sort of see some of the methyl changes to sort of allow us to sort of give it to patients long enough. Uh, so that's where I've stepped back and said, hmm, it's probably going to be too hard to develop if we go forward. Other questions? The first phase one was done here at the university, and uh, and we had one solid tumor, metast metastatic, responding. It was a head and neck tumor for six months, a complete response, complete. And uh, so there is something to it in solid tumors, I'm, I'm convinced. 
yeah, study after study has uh, proven that wrong so far, and that's the problem, because we all want to believe, and you know, the work we've done with HDAC inhibitors as well, that the signal in solid tumors is there. Uh, and so how we use these drugs, what we're finding sort of with nivolumib or the PD-1 inhibitor, uh, that we had had a, um, uh, you know, our stand up to cancer study in lung cancer, then when they progressed on a combination of azacitidine plus antenostat, they went on to nivolumib and the response rate was higher than they had seen. And so that group published that cancer discovery last year. So now there's this priming theory with all of our epigenetics on our solid tumor sides is that we've done a lot of studies. We're looking at giving it if they progress by standard resist criteria, then we're looking at their response to their next therapy because if it's antigen regulations or sort of priming to allow them to be more sensitive, uh, so the whole concepts of synthetic lethality comes into play that we may be activating the right genes that the next drug. So that's where our primary focus is at this point. The last question I want to ask you is um, you have a list of 4,000 drugs and you, had a made a, you made it kind of a priority. How many do you have to go? So I think, you know, because it's a library and it can be done high throughput, mm -hmm. they're able to sort of test all of the drugs and then sort of give you your, your peak list. Uh, so when we've done it for different screens, disulfiram comes in very high for a lot of tumors. Um, so that one pops up a lot for a lot of different assays. But when you look at HIF-1, the um, cardiac glycosides came out for BRAF, it was the mebendazoles. Uh, so it does sort of select itself based on the target. So you're working on the next... Yeah, we are, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.